Thanks a lot, Helena, for the introduction. And thanks also to Helena and Alex for letting me the opportunity to give a talk about our recent work. And I will talk about work which we did together with Tomáš Jungwirth in Prague and Jairo Sinova in Mainz. And uh, I will also mention many connections also uh, which we did together with uh, some speakers which we will have later uh, this week. And uh, I mentioned here also many other people with whom we collaborated, like with Helena, with Rafael, with Dominic, also with Igor Mazin, for instance. And also with Jakub, uh, who was the first speaker. So let me start. Uh, if you want to just remember one sentence or one message from my talk and then just say like, yeah, that's a theory talk, let's forget. I'm putting it here, yeah, then we can just rest. So conventionally, when we think about collinear magnets, we are thinking that we have either ferromagnets and ferrimagnets, or we have antiferromagnets. And uh, what I would like to show you today, that when we look on collinear magnets by symmetries, we have actually third class. And this third class is specific in real space by having these anisotropic unconventional spin densities, which are related by rotations. And in the momentum space, it has this D-wave-like anisotropy of the Fermi surfaces. And the alternating spin channels are again connected by rotations. And such a band structure also breaks time reversal symmetry. So I will talk mainly about these papers. And I divide the 20 minute talk into two parts. First part will be about how we arrive at this notion coming from discoveries of anomalous response in something what we originally thought are some exotic antiferromagnets, but now it turns out that they are separate third class. And in the second part, I will show you uh, two interesting effects. One will be non-relativistic spin currents in these materials, and another one will be relativistic anomalous hole dissipationless currents. So let me start with the first part. What shall I do about this? Yeah, maybe another one, yeah. Thanks. So let's see if this one will work better. Yeah, fantastic, this one is better. Is it? Okay, I have to always be here, I guess. <laughs> so, let me start uh, with the first part. The most known magnets are ferromagnets, which humanity knows for many millennia now, actually. And uh, the, arguably the first person who was discussing them in terms of symmetries was Pierre Curie. And when you look into his biography notes, he is actually quite unhappy that he uh, spend time on Nobel winning prize discoveries in other fields because he is saying that he perhaps should have worked more on magnets because he believes that there are some interesting symmetries. And uh, today we will see that's indeed the case, but it was waiting for more than a century to be discovered. And the typical properties of ferromagnets are that they have magnetization and in the momentum space they have spin split bands, which typically split isotropically. And also they have all in time reversal symmetry odd effects, like anomalous hole effect, for instance. And also because they have net magnetization, you can quite, quite easily control them by external magnetic fields. And in this class also belong ferrimagnets, where you have opposite spin sublattices, but one of them is larger than the other, so you still have some substantial non-relativistic magnetization. And then later in, 90, in the beginning of the 20th century, there were some unconventional magnets or paramagnets, people didn't know how they should think about them because they were behaving experimentally neither as ferromagnets, neither as non-magnetic systems. And the problem was that they were really not susceptible to magnetic fields, even more than paramagnets. That's something what Jakub was mentioning in the morning. And that's why eventually Nell and Landau suggested that inside the material we have negative molecular field, which results in such a antiparallel ordering. And this antiparallel ordering 
results in zero magnetization. And in momentum space, we have crammers that generate spin bands. And that also means that there are no ferromagnetic-like effects allowed, which are odd in time reversal symmetric. Actually, if you look into the Nobel Prize of Nell, he's saying, yeah, these are super interesting, but perhaps useless materials exactly for this reason, that all these effects are prohibited by symmetry. But with the advent of antiferromagnetic spintronics by Tomáš, Alan, and others in the past uh, two decades, people started to look into how to make these materials useful, and we have seen in the morning, for instance, that we can make non-collinear antiferromagnets, they can be interesting, or we can do some splitting by rush bar relativistic effect, or we can make some complicated uh, multiple unit cell spin density wave or some spin spiral. And then we can have a lot of exciting physics, but it will be all still on the background of antiferromagnetic ordering. And then in maybe last 20 years, there were arising questions, mainly in strongly correlated community, if there can be anything else beyond these two types of collinear magnets. And uh, surprisingly, from a different direction, there came advancement, and that was in the uh, past few years, the exploration of ruthenium dioxide. And that's a material about which I believe we will hear more talks uh, this week. And what is interesting about it is, what I show you on the first slide, that uh, in certain aspects, it behaves as antiferromagnet. So if you look at the quantization axis of the spin densities, they are perfectly compensated. And in some other aspects, it behaves sort of as ferromagnet because you have a spin splitting in the dense structure. But in yet another aspects, it's neither of those. It's sort of unconventional. And one of these things is this anisotropic magnetization density. Another thing is that even though you have a spin splitting, because of this D-wave symmetry, this rotational D-wave symmetry, it's perfectly compensated. So <clears throat> the question is, how shall we understand this? Is, this? is this just some outlier, some specific black swan material, and there is only one of its kind? Or what's going on? So <clears throat> that there is maybe more interesting to this material. Uh, there were reported, actually, some interesting responses. So first of these responses was anomalous hole current. So when you calculate momentum space resolved intrinsic hole conductivity, you obtain non-zero Berry curvature which sums up to hole conductivity, which can be as large as in ferromagnets like iron. Another effect, which is even more bizarre, is that when you calculate the spin current of such a band structure, you obtain 34 degrees spin hole angle. So that's a value which is one to two orders of magnitude stronger than the outliers of 20,000 of relativistic spin hole effect materials. So people scanned so many materials, and the outliers were materials like platinum, and they have fractions of percent, realistically, the spin hole angle. So here, first material we hit, 34 degrees. Maybe that's interesting. And then, <clears throat> perhaps because these effects are so strong, they were quite quickly also verified experimentally and discovered experimentally. And about these discoveries, I believe we will have two talks. So one talk will be about Dominic. He will talk about related alter magnet and uh, anomalous hole effect in this system. And we will have tomorrow a talk from Arnab, who will talk about the uh, discovery of this spin splitter uh, physics in ruthenium dioxide. And then uh, this uh, type of physics was actually reported in many other materials. And there are some references, including some recent reviews on these topics. So if you want to look into this more. And I want to conclude the introduction by highlighting what is the conflict now. Yeah, what is the conflict? So how we should treat this ruthenium dioxide. So we have this ferromagnetic-like response. Yeah? So from this perspective, you would think it's a ferromagnet. However, we have zero magnetization. So you would think it's an antiferromagnet. But then we have these three exotic properties, which are not present in neither ferromagnets nor antiferromagnets. And this is namely this spin splitter torque, which is actually in very uh, curious geometry appearing, as Arnab will tell you later. And then we have this, again, these anisotropic densities in real space and this exotic 
uh, D-way spin splitting in the momentum space, which does not depend on relativistic spin on brief interaction. So how we should understand this from the perspective of symmetries? So we were working on this actually for many years, and uh, the conventional relativistic magnetic group theory uh, cannot explain this physics for the following reason. So when you look at the two extreme limit, basically looking at the Kiri and him thinking in terms of symmetries of ferromagnets as uh, electromagnetic uh, classical systems, or if you go even into the opposite quantum ultra relativistic limit and you think about them in terms of Dirac equation, what you always do in terms of symmetries, you consider operations which are coupling the real space, the crystallographic space, and the spin space. So when you have a systems like this, what you can do, you can apply, for instance, mirror symmetry, which I will highlight by a blue, uh, by a blue color. And when you apply this symmetry, you are applying it simultaneously on the spins and simultaneously on the atoms. So then, for instance, all these three systems will have the same magnetic symmetry. In this example, it would be M prime, M prime, M, which means that we have two mirrors with time reversal combined and another mirror without time reversal. That's this mirror which I'm showing. And now, you see that you cannot distinguish by the symmetry between ferromagnet and antiferromagnet, stick ordering, what you would consider, yeah, parallel or antiparallel, because they have exactly the same symmetry exactly for the reasons that they are coupling these two spaces. But it's getting even worse, <laughs> because you can obtain the same symmetry group for non-collinear magnets. So how, how, how shall we address this problem? And the answer is, let us think about uh, these Fermi surfaces. So I have a question for you. What, if you forget about the color, let's say, let's simplify the discussion, what symmetry do you see? The highest rotational symmetry of this square. Is it C6, C2, C4? Right, Jacob, it's C4. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, so you see it's like a square, yeah? And you saw that in this M prime, M prime, M relativistic symmetry group, you didn't have uh, this symmetry operation. So we need to search some symmetry operations which will recover this symmetry. And when we do so, we can go back to Landau, who actually was saying, okay, we should consider the full magnetization density and look at all the symmetry operations of this magnetization density. And when you do that, and you decouple the two spaces, you will obtain something what is in mathematical literature known as a spin groups. So here I have two-fold rotation in a spin space and four-fold rotation in a crystal space, okay? And then I can analyze the non-relativistic part of the Hamiltonian, so I forget for time being about the spin orbit interaction, and then I can write down the symmetry group of the system, which is magnetic in this format. So this is two-fold rotation and this is four-fold rotation in the crystallographic space. So I, I obtain the spin group, which is able to describe correctly the magnetization density, the compensation and the ordering. So now, when we apply this uh, spin group symmetry operations, we can understand ferromagnets, which do not have any symmetry operation which would connect opposite spins. And we have antiferromagnets where we have translation or inversion between the opposite spin sublattices. But then we have this third actually type of symmetry operations, yeah, purely mathematics. And this third class actually has combinations of changing the spin with rotation. And surprisingly, there is similar amount of possibilities in terms of mathematical possibilities. So in principle, this shouldn't be just one material, but it should be maybe many materials. And with this theory, we can now explain all this physics. So let's look at uh, some of this physics. So first, first interesting thing is that uh, there were many people like Hirsch and Xu Sheng Zhang who were asking the question if we can have actually something like that. But if you look into the literature, people were trying to realize such a states by correlations. So by Pomeranchuk instabilities as a small deformations due to many body corrections uh, to your system. So then you should be able uh, to obtain basically analogy between superconductors and magnets. 
because they are raising the question that when you have S-way superconductor with this gap function symmetry, this corresponds to ferromagnetic spin splitting. So then we should have also analogy between superconductors and magnets. And that's exactly what you have. And it's actually a small subclass of this generic spin group theory of outer magnets where we can actually now realize this analogy with the D-wave, D-wave superconductivity. And that's the class of outer magnets I will focus today on. Dominic will talk about something a little bit different. So, now remains the question. Everyone was expecting this splitting perhaps should be small because if, when you look at other types of splittings like the relativistic Rajba splitting, this is a material which attracted a lot of attention, bismuth, tellurid, iodine, about 10 years ago. It has heavy elements and it's the record value of spin splitting in bulk or one of the record values. And you see that it's maybe like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 electron volt. So let's look at how large is the splitting in our ruthenium dioxide. And you see that the splitting is huge. So the splitting is one electron volt. So the first material we hit, splitting one electron volt. Now, what is the reason for this large splitting? And it's quite counterintuitive because you have to look into microscopic uh, details of the system and you will realize that there is another pair of bands and that the splitting actually works as in this cartoon. So I start with orbitally split but spin degenerate non-magnetic system, which looks like this, okay? So I need to have sort of orbitals of the symmetry. And then when I switch on magnetism, I will obtain this type of splitting. And now this large splitting due to electrostatic crystal field is now copied into the magnetic state. So this is like completely different mechanism of splitting, unlike in ferromagnets due to exchange, unlike in relativistic systems due to the spin orbit interaction, which is relativistic, completely non-relativistic effect. And then we can look into all possibilities. So here is a table of all possibilities. And uh, we will hear about some of these materials. But then the point is that you still might say, okay, that's a fantastic system, but maybe it was just a coincidence. So how many, not mathematical possibilities, but real materials possibilities we have? So we took some databases and magnetic databases of uh, realistic materials. And we took almost 1,000 of materials and we use our spin group theory to sort them. And when we sorted them, we found out that there is more outer magnets than ferromagnets even. Yeah? And one needs to think about it that nobody was looking into this physics. So they were just identified by pure coincidence and nobody was worried about the splitting. So maybe when we will search more, we will obtain even more of them. But as a, as a first evidence that this is a general physics, I think having almost 200 of uh, material candidates uh, and having more material candidates than ferromagnets in the conventional databases, yes? No, these are insulators and uh, metals as well, but I have also more detailed sorts. So if you want to look into some, we can discuss. Thanks. Okay, cool. So now I will just briefly uh, mention uh, two applications of this physics. So one will be non-relativistic spin currents and the other one will be this anomalosal effects where we have now also experimental evidence, thanks to Helena, Jikvi and Dominic. But I will not talk in that much detail because Dominic will I have uh, his talk focused on this physics. So let me start with the non-relativistic physics, which is related uh, in some way to what was mentioned by Jakub uh, in the morning. But now we understand it from the perspective of these non-relativistic spin symmetries. So we can again take this model of this uh, D-wave spin band structure. And now apparently when you apply electric current, it will get spin polarized. So now you can build from it things which people were in spintronic searching for two decades like having a GMR type of effects without magnetizations. And we have calculated actually this longitudinal spin current and the GMR ratio. And you can see that here you obtain this 34 degrees. So the spin current polarization is really super huge. And here you see that the GMR can be an unfermi level between 30 and 100 uh, uh, degrees. So you can basically replicate some ferromagnetic effects which made it even into commercial devices without relying on magnetization. 
So that has uh, many interesting applications related to the properties of having compensated magnetism. Some of them were mentioned in the morning's talks. And then we have even this unconventional situation, which you usually do not have in ferromagnets. And that's when you apply the electric field in this direction, you end up with having actually uh, transverse spin polarized currents and its orientation, its spin polarization, unlike in conventional relativistic spin hole effect, is now tuned by the orientation of the antiferromagnetic vector. So here following the morning, uh, a great, uh, great question from Max, I added also a picture here uh, where you see that actually the magnitude of the effect uh, almost does not depend on the orientation of the uh, antiferromagnetic vector because uh, you see that when you add spin orbit interaction, you only slightly renormalize this huge uh, spin angle. So it's all non-relativistic physics, not related to the orientation of the spin quantization axis, but you can use the nail vector rotations to tune the orientation of the spin quantization axis. And this is effect, this effects will be more discussed in detail uh, by Arnab because you can use uh, such a spin current to torque adjacent magnet. Okay, and now in the last few minutes, uh, if uh, Elena still allowed me. Yeah, well, we yeah so may, maybe two minutes is okay. So now this was all dominated by non-relativistic physics and now we add spin orbit interaction. So then we can look at anomalous hole effect where we have conventionally ferromagnet and when we add spin orbit interaction, uh, the symmetry breaking, the time reversal symmetry breaking is translated from the spin sector to the orbital sector. So your wave functions will acquire transversal uh, movement and you will obtain this extra, extra contribution to your whole conductivity, which is odd in magnetic field and which was discovered like in 1880 by Hall. In past uh, 10, 15 years, people like Alan McDonald, Satoru Nakatsui, Claudia Felser, Stuart Parking were looking and discovering these effects in non-collinear antiferromagnets, where it turns out that you can have additional contribution which is arising from this non-collinear spin texture. And now I will just show you quickly two examples that you can have anomalous hole effect very large also in these collinear outer magnets. So the first example is ruthenium dioxide. So now you can apply the symmetry rules to realize that actually you have allowed this anti-symmetric hole vector. And on top of it, when you are rotating this oxygen octahedra in ruthenium dioxide, even though you are keeping the same spin quantization axis, you are changing the orientation of the whole uh, effect sign. So that's why we sometimes refer to this mechanism as crystal uh, time reversal symmetry breaking. And then, when you calculate Berry curvature, as I was showing in the beginning, it sums up to non-zero large value. And you can also decompose this value uh, into contribution from counting and contribution from the outer magnetism. And you see that in the calculations, this red, uh, this red contribution to the whole conductivity for outer magnetism is always dominating. Interestingly, our collaborator, Jacques Liu was able to measure this effect experimentally but because, as Max mentioned, the easy axis is not susceptible to the whole effect, you need to rotate the easy axis to different direction by applied magnetic field, and when you do so, you will start to obtain uh, hundreds of cement centimeters of the whole effect. And this brings me to the last slide. So we saw that we can induce the anomalous hole effect in outer magnetic uh, ordering by applying external magnetic field. The question is, can we have also spontaneous? And can we have anomalous hole effect which will not require some complicated frustrated lattice like in these non-collinear antiferromagnets? And the answer is this crystal of manganese five silicon free in uh, thin epi layers, because it turns out that you can realize their outer magnetic D-wave uh, spin symmetry as well. Uh, so you have in polarized bands, you get a large spontaneous hole conductivity. And uh, Helena, Vincent, Sebastian, and many others of our great collaborators actually uh, discovered this effect first in these epi layers by measuring simultaneously the hole resistivity and magnetization. And you see that these two effects are not related to each other, and even you see that at the spontaneous uh, zero magnetic field, you have zero magnetization 
but large uh, spontaneous hole resistivity. More about these effects will talk uh, Dominic in uh, his talk. So with this, let me just show you uh, the references to the reviews that now this new class of magnets is opening many different directions. I mentioned few, but from the more speakers today, you will hear uh, more exciting things. Looking forward for your questions. <laughs>